Hi there, Andy Warwick here. This video is based on a recent talk I gave to a history seminar in Oxford, which was also the local launch of my book, A Killing Fever. And it was essentially my journey into using fictive history to interpret the Victorian world. And I'm going to start by saying a bit about some of my earlier research in the history of physics, because it's shaped my creative thinking since then. When I began my research career in Cambridge in the mid-1980s, I'd caricature the history of theoretical physics something like this. You use technical expertise to show who'd got to which equation first. The equations were in articles like this one. This is the Cambridge mathematician John Henry Poynting deriving his energy flow theorem, now known as the Poynting Vector, in the Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society in 1884. He's a dead white man. And the theorem is presented as a logical derivation from Maxwell's equations in his treatise on electricity and magnetism of 1873. That's what mathematical physicists were supposed to do. But in the 1980s, history of science was taking a strongly cultural turn, led in Cambridge by Simon Schaffer, especially in the sociology of science. Much of that new work focused on the history of machines, technicians and experiment. But as an historian of theoretical physics, I wanted to write a complementary, practice-based account of theorising. Not the idealised reconstruction we see in Poynting's paper, but the messy, open-ended and negotiated world of theory and theorists in the making. That work was published as Masters of Theory, and that's me around the time I began the project. We just saw the middle-aged pointing at his energy flow theorem in Masters of Theory. I explained that work very differently. Now, I realise a nearly 600-page book is very last century, so I've remade it here as a one-page graphic novel. In the middle is an exam script written by the 24-year-old Poynting in Cambridge Senate House in 1876. You can see the difference. He's working in real time, making mistakes, crossing things out, reconceptualising before our eyes. No logical certainty, no neat derivation. Around the paper are the resources that made him. His mathematics coach, Edward Ralph, books of past exam questions, exemplars as Kuhn called them, class teaching on a blackboard, written exams in policed silence, a huge change from the public disputation in Latin that had dominated university exams for centuries. The exam results were published in the national press. You can see a list top left, an incitement to heroism or fear of humiliation. Team sport as a model of manly competition. Competitive sports arrived in Cambridge with competitive exams. A coach was first a maths tutor. Women were excluded because it was said they were mentally unsuited to a system that routinely pushed men to mental breakdown. Until 1890, when Philippa Fawcett, champion hockey player, beat the highest scoring man. Instead of assuming technical skill, I made it the problematic. How was it generated in that particular time and place? How did it produce research? Poynting's energy flow theorem, for example, came from a mixture of exam questions, Cambridge textbooks, and writing a course in the theory of sound. The logical derivation we just saw was a carefully constructed fake. My study was in historical anthropology, putting some ethnographic flesh on what Wittgenstein called a form of life. For exam scripts and boat races, I built an organic picture of how theorists were made, depicting theory not just as an embodied language, but as an instrument of the state, of empire, of masculinity, of oppression, of elitism, and social mobility. Somewhat later, through my master's teaching, I got interested in global history, and I began to ask questions that seemed to follow from my earlier work. For example, could you connect Cambridge mathematics with, say, an indigo plantation worker in Bengal? Here's an answer in another graphic. Cambridge graduate William Thompson showed a transatlantic submarine telegraph cable was possible. He designed one to help lay it. You can see the British telegraph network circa 1900. Why was it worth the huge cost? Partly for colonial management in the world's first global empire. But in the middle, you can see the Money Market Review founded in 1860, a journal for a new Victorian popular capitalism. Telegraphy told investors about global prices, letting them use telegraphic messages to buy and sell stocks and shares. There's a note telling you a large shipment of indigo has increased demand and price in Calcutta. So I began to build these connections from Cambridge, Maxwell's treatise on electricity and magnetism, telegraphy and capital, 
all the way to the Bengal jungle. What interested me were these highways of imperial modernity built from science, trade, machinery and financial interest. But that inclusiveness immediately begged questions of gender and race. How to approach a topic that big? I knew I wanted my historical narrative to be four things. Inclusive, organic, engaging and personal. I knew the approach I'd used in Masters of Theory wouldn't work because there were multiple sites. Let's start with inclusive. My research became inclusive without me really trying. I shifted it into cyberspace, found myself in a virtual Victorian world, largely uncurated, full of random encounters and improbable connections. You can see a few here, from historical maps, Google engrams, photographs and true crime cases from the old Bailey Online, to hobbyist reenactors who demonstrate every kind of Victorian weapon. I found a photo of my sleuth's sitting room in Adelphi Terrace. Then there's Google Books. No catalogues, no paper slips, no fetching. It's the historiography of research engines, the brainless algorithm of artificial intelligence, like the random encounters a novelist takes from everyday life. Books on safety deposit boxes and the cash economy, press reports on bare knuckle boxing matches, hedgerows versus galvanized fences in the new suburban landscape the first journal of Victorian feminism, gay bars in mid-Victorian London, manuals on how to colonize the world. I dug out lost voices and causes, many beyond the usual archive. I've included these hands caught on a page as a small act of gratitude to the data entry workers, mostly people of color, who work 10 hour shifts so we can work on our laptops. What about organic and engaging? We academics are constantly badgered by the British government to do something called public engagement, make our work accessible. Could I make my kind of history of science, technology and medicine accessible without resorting to the media hooks of the lone genius, experimental breakthroughs or the wonders of nature? Could I use a thriller to organize the mass of material I was finding online? Here's the Scots novelist Val McDermid who pioneered lesbian crime fiction in her work as a gay rights activist. As she put it, murder is just a lure. The books are about class, politics, gender, place, the human psyche, race, justice, love, sex, economics, inequality, and why not science, machinery, and medicine. I began imagining a sleuth whose life threaded times, places, and issues via an imagined crime and its solution. He'd be my ethnographer of Victorian empire, the world organic, and the story engaging. I chose mid-Victorian Britain because it was so rich in new techno-science. The first and second laws of thermodynamics unifying the physical sciences, Darwin's origin of species, the same for life on Earth. The first organic molecule, movine, synthesized from fossil fuel. The railway and telegraph upending the very notions of space and time. The germ theory of disease, anaesthetic and antiseptic surgery stirring change in medicine. A thriller needs pace and action at multiple sites, especially if you're telling a, an imperial story over three days and 6,000 miles. You need the locomotive, the ocean steamer, and the submarine telegraph, and of course that greatest and most discomforting of Victorian machines, the new metropolis of London. I wanted an age that spoke to our own. Mid-Victorian Britain forged a consensus that progress through social reform and scientific discovery was both inevitable and desirable at home and through the civilizing mission in its empire. A consensus built on race and gender hierarchies, which, as the late Eric Hobsbawm put it, was exploited by sober men in sober clothes, spreading respectability and a sentiment of racial superiority, together with gas works, railway lines and loans. It's a consensus that's now unraveling. That's why the Victorians wouldn't have told my story about themselves. It's a view from our age, not theirs. But how to express that view in my sleuth's own mid-Victorian voice? Which brings me to personal. I wanted to voice my history through a life, as someone familiar enough with imperial culture to have agency and insight, yet alienated enough by the dark side of empire to look askance at London and its native tribes. I found the Santal people of Bengal in Ranjit Guha's essay, Prose of the Counterinsurgency. 
they were an egalitarian farming society in the Bengal hills, given land by the East India Company to farm crops like indigo and silk. In 1855, after years of ruthless exploitation, they declared war on company rule. Led by the brothers Sidhu and Kanhu, they defeated the company's local troops and advanced on its imperial strongholds. The company army, armed with Enfield rifles, killed 10 to 15,000 Santal, destroyed their villages, starved and dispersed the remainder into the hills. Company soldier Walter Sherwill reported the slaughter for the Illustrated London News. He sketched the about-to-be-hanged Sidhu, you can see in the centre, Santal archers standing their ground against volleys of rifle fire and a war elephant destroying a village. In the company's political prose, Sherwill praised the bravery of Santal archers while condemning them as cruel, crafty, deluded and in need of improvement by British rule. The Santal fight wasn't in vain. They were given homelands they still defend with bows and arrows. For example, in 2016, a Bangladesh sugar mill grabbed some of their land. In the ensuing battle, three Santal were shot dead, their homes torched, and the land fenced off with barbed wire. Theirs is an ongoing fight to maintain their sustainable way of life against the incursions of rapacious free market capitalism championed in the British Empire. The East India Company partly ruled India in writing. In dispatches, laws, regulations, proclamations, maps, biographies, gazetteers, histories, newspapers, journals, textbooks. In this graphic, I've shown company magistrate William Hunter's ethnography of rural Bengal, mass printed to train imperial soldiers and administrators. These works told the world what British India was. They still do, now as an archive in the British Library. Every word assumes, legitimates and extends company rule in historical time. To find other voices, subversive reading is necessary because colonised people didn't record an independent voice of their own. In the 19th century, the Santal were an oral culture. To let them speak, I've played company authors off one against another, separating evidence from evident political purpose. I've also used the Santal's own history of themselves. Here are scenes from videos of the 150th anniversary of the revolt and a 2021 song by the Santal singer Rathin Kisku. Three Santal retell stories handed down the generations. On the left, statues of Sidhu and Kanhu that are the focus of annual remembrances. On the right and below, the revolt is reenacted, Sidhu whipped by the sober men in sober suits. Top right is a Santal painting of the revolt. A corrupt official is hacked to death while company soldiers flee Santal arrows. I've used these sources to create my sleuth, Haider Khan, to give his personal view of Imperial Britain in the summer of 1857. In my fictive history, Killing Fever, Khan's haunted by the brutality of company rule, but he's empowered by its education system. As assistant in Calcutta to the doctor and pioneer of medicinal cannabis, William O'Shaughnessy, he's a finer forensic chemist than any in London. In 1857, he travels to the empire's metropolitan capital with evidence of company abuses in Bengal. Like many imperial subjects, he has a very fanciful idea of what London's really like. Hoping to find justice, he's arrested and condemned for a killing he didn't do. But then comes a remarkable offer. He'll be released if he can find the meaning of a small bottle of pale green liquid. I'll end with three scenes from the book. Don't worry, there are no spoilers. To order my material from the web, I often make collages of storyboards, powerful images that make Khan's thoughts tangible and connected, just as the Santal paint their history. Early in Killing Fever, he's called to the London Imperial Bank in the city. He's intrigued. It's the most modern bank in the world, fitted with every safety device displayed at the Great Exhibition of 1851. The steel staircase and doors to the basement are protected by cipher locks and electromagnetic bolts, lit with arc lights. At the bottom is a brick mausoleum with 500 steel lockers. Through another door are plush consultation rooms like offices, illuminated with sunlight piped down by clockwork mirrors. In the vault deep under London, he meets two desperate people. The first is the manager, Mr Eatwell, a man usually eager to claim his bank's impregnability. Today, He's sullen, popping Pritchard's aromatic steel pills to calm his nerves. 
One of his distinguished customers, the Reverend Elijah Doyle, professor of pharmacy at King's College on the Strand, has been found dead in a consulting room. Khan realises it's no coincidence. Doyle's the man he thought most likely to have made the liquid. It's also a mystery. On the table, Doyle's left a page of gibberish and a silver cigar case. He didn't smoke. Beneath his cold, limp hand is a revolver he didn't own. Eat well certain it's suicide. He'll stake the bank's reputation. No one else was in the vault. It can't be murder. It's impossible. The other desperate person is Elijah Doyle's stepdaughter, Adelaide. She's an intelligencer by trade, selling financial secrets to London's rising capitalists. She's normally calm and self-assured, but not today. Elijah was the man who gave her a superb education, a man she loved. Where it was sure it's suicide, she's as certain it isn't. Elijah was a devout Christian whose drugs saved native lives and native souls. He was terrified of eternal damnation. Khan's careful investigation confirms there was no one else in the vault when Doyle died, but also that he was shot in the head, twice, and the first shot certainly killed him. He quizzes Eatwell and Miss Doyle, each so keen to have their versions verified, their answers are surprisingly unguarded. Khan assumes the officers are there to trade what's in the lockers, gold and silver, works of art. Not so, says Eatwell. The wealth is stored on paper rent, loans, insurance, deeds for mines and farms. Could you buy an indigo plantation right here? Of course. But how can a document signed beneath London change life in Bengal, as if a sheet of paper acted across space like gravity? Miss Doyle, whose business is wealth on paper, tells Khan to think of a train ticket. It'll take you to Edinburgh by steam and steel, by brick buttress and tunneled rock. From this vault under the city, a paper contract pipes your interest through dispatches and telegraphs from the steel vaults to the steel tip of a sepoy bayonet. Carl already knows how Doyle died, why it mattered he was a Christian, but this vision of virtual trade, of the devil's storehouse underground, where the earth's cultivators are made the slaves of loans and taxes, shows the scene of crime stretches 5,000 miles. Now he knows how Doyle's killer walked through steel doors, how he was robbed, and why. Khan's investigation take him and Adelaide Doyle, who's muscled in on the investigation, to Kew Gardens, west of London. They inveigle their way in to see the deputy director, Joseph Hooker, who has his own bank, the specimens in the herbarium and the garden. Hooker's not in a good mood, partly because the last time he saw Khan in Calcutta, he made a fool of himself smoking medicinal cannabis, but mainly because the garden's been shut by an East India Company officer due to a suspicious fire in one of the hothouses. Hooker loathes the company because it wouldn't fund his Indian flora. Convinced Khan's investigation will damage the company, Hooker agrees to show them the burnt out hothouse. On the way, Miss Doyle admires the garden's horticultural beauty, which irritates Hooker. He resents the suburban gardeners and amateur botanists who come to admire the flowers, deflecting him from his real work, solving the greatest mystery of philosophical botany. He intends to show all plants a variants of originally created pears. Stung by his superior tone, the atheist and materialist Miss Doyle expresses surprise a man of science believes the Christian myth of creation. Surely species are the myth. Hooker retorts it takes a professional botanist to perceive the change in plants as they migrate over vast distances, always warring, contending for monopoly of the soil, the stronger ejecting the weaker, the more vigorous killing the delicate. Only in the Eden of Kew Gardens can they assume their created forms. Miss Doyle almost laughs at this fairy tale spun on colonial expansion. The garden's no more than a stockyard of vegetable economics and exotic blooms to decorate the gardens in expanding suburbs. Khan mentions Robert Fortune, a plant hunter he knew in Calcutta, the man who smuggled Chinese rhododendrons to London and Chinese tea to British India. Miss Doyle points out the Chinese wanted silver bullion for their tea now they're paying cash for opium. Hooker remarks that Robert Fortune recently claimed the Chinese had a miraculous cure for fever. He even sent some living specimens of the plant it came from. It's nonsense, of course. The man's a fantasist. But Khan's thinking about plants warring as they colonize the world, finding sanctuary in the empire's botanic gardens. Now he understands why it was an East India Company soldier who offered to exchange his freedom for the meaning of a pale green liquid. 
the British Empire's fate depends on it. Precisely how turns out to be a tricky question, because the mechanisms of empire are tangled with the machinations of its managers. When Khan tracks down the malignant hand, he's invited to East India House to make a deal. He expects a business-like exchange, a chance to outwit his foe. But he's taken upstairs to the company museum, part library, part graveyard of Indian culture, a place the Victorian public comes to view the inferiority of primitive people, to appreciate the civilizing mission. Instead of sitting face to face, Khan's led through a doll's house of relics, an anatomy room of dismembered lives, cabinets of spears and tapestries and tusks, each label reaffirming Indian degradation, their knowledge rude, their artists blundering, their craftsmen useless, the musical instruments made in ignorance of acoustics. At last a doll's house of the Santal, hung with the drum and flute, the bow and arrow, a sprig of the saltery, fragments of Khan's childhood with his mother put on show as trophies of war. He's here to be humiliated, wrong-footed. But he's heard the insults too often. His mother taught him long ago that true wealth lives in the soil, in the simple splash of rain. And he's more than familiar with Eustace Liebig's agricultural chemistry. A museum window looks down on Leadenhall Street in the city's heart, choked with fancy carriages and fancier people. Khan makes it his exhibit. Behold London's nemesis, destruction from within. The Thames fetid with nitrogenous waste from three million eating bread, stripping the vitality of English fields. The Chinese coolies paid to dig manure on Pacific islands to sail to England to revive the tired soil. Until it's gone. Until Peter can't be robbed to pay Paul. The trick works. Khan's adversary sees his own worst fears. London, the precarious dream. The museum, reality. Three short scenes from Killing Fever. The mystery organising the archive. The actors voicing the history. Personal, inclusive, organic. No footnotes, no bibliography, no secondary sources, no argument. The authenticity is taken on trust and as an exercise for the reader. I hope it's engaging enough that you'll want to read it. If you do, please let me know your thoughts. If you'd like to try your hand at this kind of fictive history, I'm making some more videos in which I explain how I planned and wrote the book. I look forward to an ongoing discussion. See you in the next video.